stressed for us is um, has a, it feels like it's got sort of a folk root, um, but you're kind of pushing it more, a little more edgy, especially the knife, which is a surprising track at the end. Am I right in thinking that you're kind of just trying to decide what kind of a band you are still when you're, you're trying out its different? Well, in the cottage, you know, looking yeah, back, cottage, yeah. without that, you know, it was a key moment, the cottage. Also, because we, were we weren't in London, imagine we'd been in London, you know what I mean? Seeing yeah. other bands coming back yeah. and saying, we were so cut off. Uh, it was so it was quite intense, wasn't it? Mm, yeah. But we, we liked... The, it was a good, good moment to be, you know, on we, your own. We did like sort of aggressive music as well, you know. It's just the way the album ended up. You know, there was another song around at the time called Going Out To Get You, which was a sort of competitor with the knife as to whether it got on the album. Uh, which is another very sort of up-tempered thing. And also the last stages of looking for someone are quite up as well. I think, you know, it's just the... the contrast a bit. Yeah, we liked contrast, and we used them within songs later, you know, to a much greater extent. You know. Yeah, and I, I, I think that was a key part of the writing. And it, Tony and I were particularly fans of the nice. Um, and although, you know, people remember Keith Emerson with Elp and all that stuff, at the time... The Nice were a very hip band, and Jimi Hendrix, you know, asked to play with them, and we'd go and see them at the marquee. And I think uh, the Nice was the working title for the Knife because it was, in fact, nice, in nice, rhythm feel. yeah, in, inspired. And uh, um, but we wanted that sort of mix of uh, aggression and in the lyric and. We felt that this sort of contrast between uh, the the pretty, more um, imaginative, folky stuff, and then some hardcore uh, rock elements with some soul references, was something that hadn't really been explored before. And that's what I think excited us was throwing it together. I mean, the, the, talking about the nice of the marquee was actually the first gig I ever saw. And it's still the best gig I've ever seen, you know. I was, I was, I'd never experienced live music in this way. I'd heard music on record for, for years and years and loved it. And it was, it was the first time I realised how good live music could be. I'd never thought of being in a live group before that. And it was just a very, very exciting moment. And it was very influential on us. On us. I mean, I went there with Peter and we just, I think we were both completely... Well, the volume amazed. too, the first live show, the volume is yeah, kind yeah. Of scary. It's, it's, it's yeah. great, but it's kind of... But there's performance in it as well, you know, and everything seemed good about it, you know. Yeah. They had a guitarist at that point. Davio List was with them as well. Oh, I think yeah, that's that was, right. When they were at their best, was as a four-piece, better than when they lost him. And it was just, you know, well, I just found it so exciting, you know. <laughs> it, <laughs> because, Rondo was just... Yeah, so because be, yeah, Rondo was the sort of uh, creme de la creme of, of their stage set at that time. And it was something that, um, yeah, was very... Zoe performance and yet driving and very musical. So I think that was a, a good, it set the bar. Um, the other thing just in the early days, because I do think Ant's role needs to be emphasized, because in a way I think of all of us, he was the most driven and uh, the most pushy mm. from a musical point of view. And confident, <clears throat> I mean, yeah. wasn't he? Musically very confident. Yeah. I think it's, uh... I think he was the driver. I mean, him and Richard actually I almost feel the sort of the driving force, and we were there. But I mean, without those two, I'm sure we'd never really got to that next period in a sense. Yeah, Rich was the eternal optimist, and whenever we had what seemed like an insurmountable problem, like where we could go, you know, he persuaded his parents to let us use their cottage, how we could move the gear around. He persuaded his dad to give up an old bread van. Top um, speed, 45 miles an hour, yeah. unless you push the accelerator pedal to the left, with yeah. 48. Bloody slow. So, uh, well, Chris's cottage was the uh, Texas Barrett's house. Of, yeah. Um, so, am I right that you pulled a hammer for walking up? Snowy steps. You did, but there yeah. were many worse places that thing had to go. And when we got the Mellotron, it was even worse. I mean, there used to be, I remember one particular gig where we thought they uh, got the, a call from the crew saying we can't play it because we can't get the Mellotron up the stairs. Nottingham Yorkshire. How, how do I know that? I don't know, Yorkshire. you remember it. And. Yeah, well, and then he, about half an hour later, he rang up and said, it's okay, they've sawn off the banisters off the thing and they've got it up there. So incredible, really, you know. There was so, another one, I think, sorry. Go on. No, in yeah. Glasgow, which I think was about four flights of stairs, we were absolutely exhausted getting the hand in particular at the top. And then 
we waited, I think the show's time was something like eight o'clock, and so at nine o'clock, there were more people on the stage than there were in the audience, so <laughs> we played three or four numbers and then um, decided to uh, buy a pint for them and sit around and have, <laughs> have a drink. <laughs> there were a few of those in those days, yeah. yeah. And there were probably other audiences that would have preferred the pint too. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is before Tony Stratton Smith, or was, was he on board this one? He was on board from the one, you know, once we started playing live, really, because from the Trespass album was released on Charisma. And so he was, uh, he was there. Yeah. What, what was your, um, how, how did that come about? Uh, was, there, was there an introduction to him? Well, John Anthony, wasn't it? John Anthony, producer saw us. Well, it was Rare Bird originally, wasn't it? Was okay. it Rare, oh, Rare Bird. Rare Bird was a group yeah, we, we, on we all admired, particularly. I mean, I thought they were a really good live band. And um, they, we played them a lot of times. They had shinier gear than us, and, and they liked us. And they recommended their um, producer to come along and have a look at us. So it was John Anthony, and he liked us and brought Tony Stratton Smith. So That's right. first, first impressions of Tony Stratton um, Smith? Well, because he managed the nice, he, you know, he was automatically a hero. Um, and, uh, and he, you know, had some gravitas to him. He was quite a larger-than-life character, an ex-sports journalist, um, and and he loved life, gambling. He was he was a gay guy, and it was um, interesting mix. I mean, there were a lot of the whole sort of gay manager story is still not really being properly told. I think for the music business, because that's that would be a good documentary because it, it's. Um, but uh, anyway, he was passionate about the music, and uh, um, once he, you know, got behind anything, um, he would really try and drive it. I mean, he he would occasionally um, find, you know, be a bit butterfly-like, and he'd be hot and then cold, and you could find your royalties buying a new racehorse, um, <laughs> but. <coughs> Oops. Oh, shit. Mm. <laughs> it's all right, it's white. Um, without him, I'm not sure what I mean. He was, you think, he was the in next three albums, mm. he was really yeah. on our... On yeah, our he was course. never prepared to back us, you know, in a way. There was no, I mean, there was no, certainly no money being made. We were costing money and there was no real, I mean, he obviously had faith that perhaps sometime in the future the group would. But we, we liked to spend money. We had an elaborate stage show, which got more elaborate as time went by. And it just, um, they backed us, you know, they, they gave us a, a, an allowance, if you like. And we didn't really get out of debt until well after Peter left. So it was kind of, uh, you know, it was both good and a bad they thing. They to us some money. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they um, also um, um, paid for us to go to New York, which was a key moment, I think. Um, so well, I think Stratton not being a businessman. Yeah, it worked in our favour because actually he had these lovely ideas, lovely ideas, you know, the New York trip and all these sort of tours we used to do. I mean, very brave, you know, financially, probably. I think we've said many hand. times that, I mean, the, the, when we came into the business, it was run by amateurs, the whole thing. It was just enthusiasts. There was no professionalism in it at all. It was fantastic. You know, everybody just sort of did this, did that. There were a few, you know, one or two professionals in there, like our manager, Tony Smith, you know, the one or two people. But in the main, it was just enthusiasts who just loved music. Um, that applied to the managers, applied to the groups, applied to the producers, everybody. That's what they were in it for, really. And no one realised it was a, that it was a money-spinning business until a bit later on. And then, of course, as soon as that was realised, then all the kind of pros came in. I mean, it must have been essential for you, actually, uh, at that point, to have an enthusiast on board. If, you know, yeah. you're travelling around in a red van and yeah. floor, uh, if, if you'd had an hard-nosed guy you'd have said, you know, you Well, I'll, I'll progress. Yeah. it was a slow progress, it was slow, that two of the albums, you know, sort of slow, but wasn't it? Yeah. But there were no big jumps up, so no happened, so, so I think Strat was, and you go and see Strat for a meeting, and he'd inspire you, wouldn't he? You'd come out feeling, yeah, this is really, you know, oh, it's just wonderful, they love you, you know, you come, oh, out, yeah. feeling, you come out feeling, <laughs> somebody said, it's sort of glowing, it's all going to be okay, actually, mm. I remember that. I mean, the only other label we were interested in was Island Records because they were very stylish, had great artists, and um, and we'd had another 
group, which was Mot the Hoople, who were championing us to Ireland in the same way that Rare Bird were to Charisma. And uh, I remember we went for this meeting um, with Guy Stevens, who was the, um, uh, he's a fairly legendary producer. We went to his office and we've been used to some other music business office, but his was an empty room with a telephone on the carpet. <laughs> um, and I, th I think, you know, Guy, he was a wonderful character, but um, not very together and organized. So we never, I don't think it ever got to um, Chris really? Blackwell. I've seen Blackwell a number of times since then. And, uh, and we've laughed about it. But. I think one of the reasons we didn't go with him was he wanted to change our name. And we thought that what little following we'd built up, this was after, we had, we, it was sort of, um, you know, our name was important because we had got a small following. We'd had a few concerts where it had gone, gone quite well. And I think that was kind of the clincher almost of us not considering them. Huh. And it sounds odd, doesn't it? But that was kind of a, a factor. Yep. Both our fans would have been upset. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would have probably been the best thing that ever happened to us, but no, uh, he didn't. He wouldn't have yeah. at the time, really, but he, he wanted something quite exotic, I think. I can't remember, but he, he was one of those kind of guys, sort of quite imaginative. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it's still that and leaving this big moment. How did that come about? Were you aware of, of Ant's problems? Well, we Not, were hearing about this yeah, panic at yeah. stage fright, and, you know, I, I mean, we all got nervous, but it, we, I couldn't really get my head around it. You know, why, when you're so passionate about music and what we would built up, um, why a little thing like stage fright should put you off? But uh, but he got more and more sort of resolute about it. Yes, yeah, so he strange because he'd been ill, do you remember? He had yeah. landed a fever or something. He really, right. be, you know. And but the funny thing is, looking back, we never really thought about having a chat and saying, you know, yeah. I mean, looking at it's easy to say now, you know. Two, two months out, give him time to get better, you know, have a chat about it, discuss it. It was like, <clears throat> I felt we were just about up and running a bit. There's a dimmer of hope, you know. Yeah, yeah. Sort and of. suddenly had three months off, we were sort of, not me, but a bit. Well, I think we all were a little bit, <coughs> we, no, we were probably uh, pretty unsympathetic. I mean, because we, as Peter said, we were all kind of fried. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a performer in any sense, really, you know, but I've been doing it. And you had to find a way of coping with it, was the way I looked at it. So now I'm quite prepared to believe he had more problems than that. But that was my attitude at the time. You know, I was only, when he left, what, I was 20 or something, you know. So it was kind of... Uh, but no discussion, was there? You just, you're thinking you know, about it. Why well, don't you just sit down and say... No. But I, I assumed, actually, him leaving. I mean, you, you say about the three months thing. I think I'd quite happily come for the three months. I assumed if he left, the band would split up. I didn't think there was any chance. And curiously, it was probably Richard talking to these two guys at one time saying you've got to carry on and, and and sort of i kind of came in on the end of that really and i thought well why not i suppose we can really. i remember i mean maybe wrong. i remember the last show hayward teeth <laughs> you drove me back i was in your car and the start of the journey was this a taxi no it might Dillman be Dillman Dillman Dillman. Dillman. <laughs> the start of the journey we were discussing it was like you know that's it you know yeah. by the time we got to your place we were like yeah you know yeah, yeah i think right. i still remember it that way but it is funny looking back that we didn't sort of look at other options. Did you did you feel uh, people think that this could be the end? And was a huge musical force in in the early band. And uh, at the same time, you know, we were all songwriters. So I've always thought, looking at other bands, that bands that are full of songwriters have a better survival rate than bands with sort of one songwriter um, when there's a split. Uh, it, so, yeah, I, I, it was difficult and depressing, but um, as Mike said, I think we it didn't take too much to um, cheer us up and uh, convince us that there was still something to explore. Onwards and upwards. Yeah. Uh, I think what we're going to do is cut. Uh, yeah. Phil and Steve, I don't know if Steve's here. Yeah. But they're, they're going to come in. Uh, right. If we have a, a 10 minute breather. Sure. Uh, sure. Five of you. Sure. In, in place. Uh, okay. Right. Well, we managed to make it to 1970 at least. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That's it. That's okay, actually, because, yes, you're right, next That's about right, should I? You had a plan, actually, I thought. Yeah. good, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. 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 great. Great. <laughs>